So I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our echo session today on legal framework versus clinical approach, ethics and capacity assessment in palliative care. Before we get into our presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which I am presenting from the city of Gatineau is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original people in what we now know as Canada, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Briefly, the Palliative Care ECHO Project is a five-year national initiative to cultivate communities of practice and establish continuous professional development among healthcare providers across Canada who care for patients with life-limiting illness. We invite you to check out our website at echopalliative.com. And the Palliative Care ECHO Project is supported by a financial contribution from Health Canada. The views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada. Many of you might know Pallium Canada for our leap core sprayer. So um, one of our most popular ones is the leap core program. It is an interprofessional course that focuses on the essential competencies to provide a palliative care approach. It can be delivered online or in person and is accredited by the CFPC and the Royal College. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Diana Vince, and I'm the Palliative Care ECHO Project Manager. Uh, today we have Sunil Rossi with us, along with Tanya McAdams. Um, Sunil, would you like to just briefly introduce yourself? Oh, hi, thank you, Diana, for that. Yes, um, my name is Sunil Rossi. Um, I'm a qualified occupational therapist, but I'm also a designated capacity assessor. So today I'm wearing the hat of a capacity assessor. Fantastic. And Tanya, would you like to just briefly introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya McAdams. I'm a nurse practitioner um, by trade and have kind of worked the gamut of different areas in healthcare throughout the years. And I'm thrilled to be here with Sunil um, to talk about something that is very important, capacity assessment. So. Thank you, Tanya. We're thrilled to have both of you with us today. I'll briefly go over the conflict of interest. So uh, Pallium Canada is a non-for-profit partially funded through a contribution by Health Canada, uh, as mentioned before. We generate funds to support operations and research and development from course registration fees and the sale of our pocketbook. I myself, along with the uh, presenters today, do not have anything to disclose. A few welcome and reminders. So for comments along for along with introductions, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know your name, your profession, and where you are attending from, what province. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. For questions, please use the Q&A function. So it's a different function if you hover at the bottom of your screen. Pull up the Q&A and throw in your question in there. What we'll do is we will address um, we will basically address all the questions at the end um, of the session. The session is being recorded and the recording and slide deck will be emailed to registrants within the next week. And please remember not to disclose any personal health information during the session. So without further ado, I'll now pass it along to Sunil. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist and a designated capacity assessor um, trained by the capacity assessment office uh, which belongs to the ministry of attorney general so i actually trained 25 years ago and at that time it was a five-day training and diana i'm just going to say next every time um so next for the next slide please um so what i want to say is at that time back in the day when we trained, it was a five day course, but nowadays uh, whenever they do offer training to um, a number of professionals, which is opened to occupational therapists, nurses, physicians, psychologists, and social workers, I believe it's become shorter in nature, but they do a lot of monitoring. They're, they're very good at um, keeping us uh, aware of what the limits of our roles are and what we should be looking for. 
And they're always there for us to support us um, as we train. And they audit our reports, including my, my own, even in 25 years later, every two years. So they take random reports to make sure that we keep a standard of quality in our reports and that we're addressing and assessing correctly. Um, we have been trained under the Substitute Decisions Act. So I wrote in brackets here on the slide, that means it's not the Health Care Consent Act. I don't work under the ministry, uh, sorry, the Mental Health Act. And I'll get into that further. But that means sometimes when there's a, an acute psychiatric patient, for instance, it might be a psychiatrist who signs off on the capacity. Um, or if they're in the hospital and it's a personal care decision, which again, I will elaborate later, that might not fall into my role. So the other thing I do to keep up with my standard is I obviously, as an OT and an assessor, is I attend various workshops throughout the year to keep up to date on various subjects. Um, personally, for me, um, even though there's a roster that the Capacity Assessment Office of Ontario uh, maintains, and you can click on, on that anywhere um, when you Google for a capacity assessor, we let them know what area we're willing to cover. So because I live in Oakville, I um, I like to see people in person. I know that there are a lot of people who do it virtually. I will only offer virtual if it's absolutely necessary because I get a better sense personally myself um, if I meet the person in person and I see that there's no influence in the room and I so I go up to about an hour from Oakville in either direction or Niagara Hamilton Guelph Toronto okay next next slide please thanks okay so what is mental capacity mental capacity is not dependent on a medical or psychiatric diagnosis um, when people call me, they sometimes think, well, they're 85 years old, therefore they're incapable. Can you just write a report accordingly? Or um, because they have dementia, it's a, they think it's a slam dunk that for sure I'll be writing a report um, just to say that they're incapable so that they can move on to the next steps. Um, or if they're, let's say, making foolish choices like buying and buying and buying on the shopping channel, something like that, they think, can you come in? Um, miss capacity assessor and call them incapable. And this is not what uh, my role is. My role is to see, given all of that, it doesn't matter that that's a, maybe a factor I have to, to know about. I want to know what their factual understanding is about their situation. Um, what is their knowledge? And how do they make reasoned choices? What do they what do they understand about foreseeable consequences of the decisions that they make? So, for example, um, sorry, I just got distracted by a question, but let, let me go back to the um, foreseeable consequences. Um, for example, what I mean by that is if, if I ask someone, uh, what do you think is going to happen if you keep spending like this? If they know that they're going to at this rate and this pace with the income that they're getting and the expenses that they have and they keep paying people out right left and center keep shopping on the shopping channel um and their their balance is dwindling and dwindling to the point where they might um be homeless and they say that if at this rate it can affect my marriage i i can be homeless and so on they understand or can foresee the consequences if they continue to, to make decisions this way. So really what I'm doing is a decisional test. I'm looking at what are the decisions relevant to their situation and what is their reasoning behind it? What do they understand about it? And what is their reasoning to make these decisions? So I hope that makes sense. What I also want to do is um, refer to one uh, sort of blog that I came across by a lawyer and I asked him for permission to share today because although we're not lawyers, we're, um, so we can't give legal advice. This is a, a legal context in, in which we're working. Um, it's not a best interest test. Some people call us to say, hey, uh, I think they're making foolish choices. I think they're at risk. Uh, I hope you find them incapable so that we can move to the next step of guardianship. Um, 
this is uh, what I'm testing again is uh, pertinent to a legal definition. Do they understand and appreciate? Understand and appreciate, I'm going to get into the definition on the next slide. But right now, what I want to say is um, mental capacity, what you have to really keep in mind is it's domain specific, it's task specific, and it's time specific. So in other words, um, certain capacities for certain things, uh, someone could be capable, for instance, of making the right choices of clothing, what to wear when it's uh, winter time, to go out and put a coat on and stay warm, but they may not make uh, sound decisions when it comes to uh, weighing the pros and cons of going to your doctor's appointment, taking your medication, uh, paying your bills, um, things like that. So mental capacity is relevant to the certain type of decision I'm asked to assess. And so the final thing I want to know to allude to for, for legal without giving legal advice is I want to clarify what happens and who makes that declaration of incapacity. Quite often people think the capacity assessor makes the final call. We're actually just making an opinion of capacity. The declaration is made by a judge, whether a person is incapable to make a certain type of decision, such as managing property or personal care decisions, and only a court, the court, okay, can make a declaration of incapacity. So the other people, including a capacity assessor, including physicians, they're making opinions. Okay, so next slide, please. So here's an example that I've uh, mentioned for mental capacity. 90% of my referrals, I would say, are related to financial decisions. So in law, um, again, we're pseudo lawyers here, but in, in the legal context, financial is under the word property. And the other type of uh, decisions that we sometimes address uh, not as often is the personal care decisions. There are six domains of personal care decisions. One is nutrition, two, healthcare, three, clothing, four, safety, five, hygiene, six, shelter. So those six domains, uh, for example, if I, uh, I've i received um, with insurance cases, sometimes they want, that's when I do do property and personal care because they want a baseline, let's say when they're doing a settlement. So lawyers will, will contact me quite often for those uh, situations. And they say, can you tell me if they have, if they're capable of making their decisions around these six domains? So quite often, some people, as I, I mentioned before, it's task specific or domain specific, they pass and they're fine when it comes to clothing decisions, maybe hygiene, they know that they should shower every day, brush their teeth, uh, grooming and so on. But the, the more complex domains, such as making decisions about shelter, uh, healthcare, nutrition, sometimes they don't pass. So these are things that we address. And what I should mention is when I do an interview to find out these, uh, their situation, what's relevant to them and what is uh, pertinent to their situation, what decisions they have to make. Um, I then also seek collateral information, which is gathering information from the requester who first called me and from people who know them better and also medical records. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the legal standard for capacity, as I mentioned, this is the sort of legal definition. So again, I want to emphasize that because a lot of times people are hoping that a capacity assessor comes in and says, oh yeah, look at these risky decisions, foolish decisions that they're making. And they, they're hoping we, we say, yes, they're, you're right. They're incapable. And then we put our rubber stamp on it and they, we fill out the forms and they think, great, now I can move on to the next step. But really what we're doing is we're seeing if they can understand uh, 
the is around the decision that they make. So for example, um, with finances, which is the 90% of my referrals, um, I want to know if they have a factual knowledge of their financial situation. Example, where do you bank? RBC, CIBC, TD. Um, hopefully they've had an opportunity to um, know some of this thing, these things, like where did they bank? How much, uh, what are their sources of income? What are their expenses? What is their balance? Um, I usually look at a couple of statements and say, what does this mean to you? Um, and if they haven't had the opportunity to look at it, or if they haven't had a, a someone ever review it for them, do can they can they learn if I tell tell them? I give them an opportunity to learn, and I I review some of this with them, and then I come back to it. The other thing I sometimes try to find out is, do they have strategies? For instance, in my case, I defer all of that to my husband, but would I know where to look if I don't know? the exact facts of my banking, what would be the options I would look at? What are my strategies? Would I would I know who to call? Would I know where to look in his office for the banking statements? How would I look uh, go about finding that information? So it's okay not to know as long as you also address, can they be educated in that regard? So that's very, excuse me, very important to fi find out as well. Uh, Next, okay, appreciate. So another standard, so there's two prongs. One is understand and the next standard is appreciate. Can they realistically appraise the outcome of their decisions? What's the justification? Why are they making these decisions? Do they just feel like it? Um, do they understand what happens if they keep at this pace or if they do this, if they lend money, do, do they know uh, they may not get it back? Uh, do they know what risk they're entering? Uh, do they know what happens if they leave their uh, bank cards lying around? Um, if they can appreciate the consequences that any reasonable person would really um, be able to appreciate, then they actually might pass. But if they have no clue, and even if you go over some of the, the issues that um, could happen and they still can't uh, fathom or appraise that or or reason it out then you have an issue so really when our when we initially were trained we were told listen if they fail the the factual understanding they're the, the you've proven them incapable because they've failed one prong of the two prongs but nowadays what they're asking for in lawyer you know this always is constantly evolving our role we're asked to look at both anyways. So even if, um, for example, I've met a, um, a client, they've had a significant brain injury or they have uh, advanced uh, dementia, they um, have not, they have demonstrated inability to understand or be educated around the facts of their, uh, their financial situation. I still will ask questions about um, the the appreciation of consequences. So I, I sort of look at the whole picture before I come to a conclusion, even if I've already proven that they didn't pass one of the prongs. Okay, next uh, next slide, please. Okay, one thing that is very important is um, assent versus consent. Because we get a lot of uh, clients um, that have been referred to us that may be already very confused. Um, I still have to tell them they have the right to refuse the assessment. The difference between informed consent, which we're all used to as clinicians, is as long as they don't refuse when I say, this is what will happen. Uh, if you're capable, carry on, do your own finances the way you want. Uh, if you're incapable, um, the lawyer involved in your case may take the next steps or it may go to the public guardian and trustee if that's the the uh, the the reason why I'm involved. I tell them what's going to happen or someone's going to apply to be guardian in your family uh, through the lawyer in front of the judge. There's there's a number of things that I find out first when I get the referral. Why am I being involved? What are you going to do with my report? So once I know that when I do the rights advice, I'm telling them what's going to happen. If, if they're found to be incapable. 
So I must say uh, to that person, you have the right to refuse. The only time they have no right to refuse is if it's court ordered. So without giving them the rights advice, um, it's not a valid assessment. Okay, the next point is, oh, sorry, can you go back? Um, I meant the next point on the slide is uh, special accommodations. So for instance, when I'm gathering uh, the background information, when the requester calls me, I want to say, well, why are you calling me? What is uh, what's the, what's the reason why you're so concerned about this person might be incapable and you need this report? Well, they could be facing eviction. They're not keeping up with rent payment, for example. Um, they, that's one example. There's a number of reasons why they call us. But one of the things that I do ask in my, in my intake screening calls is do they need an interpreter? Because again, to make it a valid assessment, if English isn't their first language or they might've been here for 50 years and English is perfectly fine, I will still ask, do they need an interpreter from what you know? And if so, we arrange that, or sorry, the person who's calling arranges it. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, the process is after I have gathered all of that intake information, I say, okay, it's appropriate for me, I believe, to get involved. Then I say, okay, I accept the referral. And if the, it's uh, something that's going to the public guardian, there's a specific referral form they have to fill out called a form four, and I'll send it to them. And then I arrange uh, an assessment time and do the interview. Uh, along with that process, um, after the interview, I cl collect uh, collateral evidence. Uh, without that, you're only seeing that little snapshot, maybe an hour interview, that's not enough. So you want to look at, um, because you've done the rights advice and they haven't refused, theoretically, then you um, look at the banking information, you look at the medical information uh, that confirms the diagnosis. Um, and then as the law states, everyone assess is entitled to a copy. Uh, so that client, whether they're confused or not, does receive a copy. And the other copy goes to, if it's the lawyer who referred, they get the copy. If it's uh, um, a public guardian and trustee situation, they get a copy. Um, fees vary. Uh, my fees that I charge, um, just to be transparent, uh, are $150 an hour plus HST. If you look at the site um, under the Capacity Assessment Office, I believe currently it says uh, assessors are charging between 100 to 250 an hour plus HST. Okay, next slide. Okay, substitute decision maker. When a person is deemed to be incapable of certain decisions, um, I'm gonna look here because the pictures are uh, blocking some of it. Uh, let me just change that for a second. Um, such as being incapable to manage their financial or property situation. The next step is that a substitute decision maker then steps in or a guardian to make decisions on that incapable person's behalf. So this is a legally authorized substitute decision maker. It might be a client representative from the PGT. We call it PGT, but it's Ontario Public Guardian and Trustee. People use P PGT for short. Um, or an appointed family member, for example. So again, I, given the limited time, I'm not gonna go into the details of what a section 16 is of the Substitute Decisions Act or a section 22, but in general, um, when it's going to the public guardian, it's called a 16. And when it's something where the person might take the same report that I do, but I'm checking off in another box 22, that means they're taking the same report and they're going with a lawyer in front of a judge to uh, apply for guardianship. Um, examples when where we're called in is sometimes long-term care facilities for clients like dementia. Uh, sometimes people in the, um, in the community are calling us about their own family member that they're concerned about. Quite often we get referrals from lawyers for uh, acquired brain injury, uh, total brain injury, motor vehicle accident type of cases. And um, when it's an acute care uh, psychiatric uh, situation, uh, uh, clients on a psych bed, uh, we refuse. Um, generally, it's something that a psychiatrist usually signs off on. Um, and sometimes it's a developmentally delayed 
uh, individual that might have reached the age of um, adulthood, um, and now the parent can no longer manage their banking situation, and then they need a legal guard, legal uh, substitute to decision maker in that case. Okay, so now I'm, I'm sorry, next slide. I'm just looking at the time to make sure I don't go over because we want to allow some time for questions. Um, so I want to talk about some interesting examples that I've come across in the 25 years. Um, I've come across a lot of different cases. Quite, um, I think one of my favorite cases that that keeps me going where I really like doing what I'm doing is when I'm protecting the vulnerable the elderly who might be financially exploited. Um, so this 90 year old client that I was uh, called about, it was actually the um, public guardian investigation unit. They called me and um, they were the referral source. And they said to me that they needed uh, me to go into to this other town um, and uh, they would there would be a police escort. And I said, why would I need a police escort? And then they explained to me that uh, what happened was there was a middle-aged couple reading the uh, obituaries and um, they would hone in on who is a fresh widow, let's say, widower, and it said survived by, and if it was survived by no one, like no children, no grandchildren, they would find their way in, in this small town to that person and offer hey, I can take you grocery shopping or I can get groceries for you. I can shovel your driveway and things like that. And as they befriended that person, little by little, they were asking for more and more money. So they were really um, up to no good. And um, the banks have their hands tied. So as the bank in a situation noticed this elderly gentleman coming into the bank and making withdrawals for a stranger who stood behind him uh, maybe 10 feet behind, 20 feet behind, the amount increased. So uh, the bank took it upon themselves to call the police and say, what do we do? Because we can't say no, it's his money. The The police then called the uh, PGT investigation unit. The PGT investigation unit looked at the roster, decided to call me, may, maybe based on the area I covered or based on my experience, I'm not sure. But they they called me and I, I accepted the case and uh, went over to the police station so that they could escort me to the um, home. And they asked the couple to leave uh, the home while they stood in the front, front of the door so that I could then just do my assessment in peace. And I met with the client. So just to, to we'll get into questions, but... Um, my job stays the same, whether it's this case or the next two cases I'm, I'm talking about. I'm assessing what his factual understanding is about a situation. I'm also probing questions about why is he paying these people? How much is he paying them? And what is his reasoning? What is his rationale? So um, in this case, uh, he talked about loneliness. He talked about wanting to keep them around. So he knew he was paying too much, but we talked about the amounts he was giving and how it worked out on an hourly basis. And when he sat down and figured that out with me, he was giving them almost $600 an hour. So when I asked him if that's something he would normally do, he he was, he was started to demonstrate some confusion. He, he really couldn't, we couldn't walk through the, reasoning and manipulate the information to get to that point where he was demonstrating, I understand these decisions, I understand the outcomes. He really just couldn't appreciate um, and go through the line of questioning. Even after educating, uh, he, he really couldn't follow it. And finally, he said, I really need help. So he was actually open to the PGT, uh, uh, managing his finances for him. Um, so in some ways, he shows some capacity to understand he needs help. So that was insight, but he he failed on the appreciation and the reason, ability to reason um, and appreciate the outcomes. Um, the next case, the 60-year-old client, um, medical malpractice. Oh, this is a very recent case. Uh, a lawyer uh, referred me 
And this is an, another uh, point I should have mentioned that even if you have understanding, even if you have appreciation, you actually have to be able to express consistently your ability to indicate your decisions. So in this case, there was a medical malpractice situation where uh, something went wrong with the, the medical treatment. Uh, I won't get into the details, but unfortunately, this client became a quadriplegic, uh, um, a quadriplegic uh, client, and he was only able to uh, use his eyes to, to communicate with a lot of equipment set up by the, a team of OTs and speech pathologists and technical people in the hospital. They were coming to the point of entering negotiations to settle a, a, a large insurance claim. So the insurance company wanted to see if he could manage this eight and a half million dollar claim, or if it's something that somebody, someone else had to manage for him, like his wife. So the lawyer asked me to come and see him. So really, I had to see him three times in that situation because the first time I really had to understand how did he, it was almost like getting to know him. How did he communicate um, using his eyes the, besides yes, no? Could he indicate consistently to me the amounts he wanted to withdraw from his account? It was very interesting with a computer setup. Um, in the end, after three times of meeting him, I noticed he he could not. Um, it, some of it was just the limitations of the technology, but unfortunately, because he could not um, indicate his his wishes consistently, uh, he was unable to pass. That was a tricky one. I actually consulted the capacity assessment office for some guidance with that that one, and which is great, which is why they're still there for us, um, for the public and for us. Um, the third scenario I want to mention was a 17-year-old. So this case, um, as I mentioned before, I get a lot of referrals where someone um, may have a developmental delay since birth. They've never been able to handle their finances. Historically, they've had attempts over the years um, with the parents teaching the school, teaching, and they've never shown an ability to understand even the concept of money or how to do banking. And so they come to me and say, listen, I, I once they turn 18, um, I, I, I want to set up guardianship or something. And so they might need that help. But what I want to point out in this case is I did not accept this referral because I said, you'll have to wait till they're 18. So that's the 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 rules as I understand it. I cannot see someone uh, and do the set uh, do the capacity assessment uh, that leads to guardianship matters until they're eighteen. Um, finally, the other reason why uh, capacity assessor, assessors are often used, um, and this falls outside of the Substitute Decisions Decisions Act, and this is outside of the um, scope of what the capacity assessment office will then get involved in because they didn't train us on this is that we're using our our experience as a capacity assessor and it's a choice um we'll be signing it from our professional designation so if i agree to do a letter of opinion that's not an sda um assessment i'll sign it as sunil rossi occupational therapist but i'll mention in the beginning of my letter of opinion my background of uh, 25 years of being a capacity assessor. So why, why would we ever take that? Sometimes lawyers or family, they wanna know if someone can actually grant or revoke a power of attorney. They want to know um, if they have the ability to make a new will or change their will, which is called testamentary capacity, or they want to know if they can even advise or instruct their uh, lawyer. Um, this is something that maybe new assessors may not want to delve into because it would take a lot of experience, in my opinion, to, to take these on. And even I'd only do a limited a number of these and only if they're straightforward, not with uh, extremely complex situations that are headed to court. 
Um, next. Next slide, please. Okay. So helpful phone numbers or email. Um, so the Capacity Assessment Office of Ontario, who trained us, this is the number that I've added to the slide or an email. Um, <clears throat> the other side of it is the Ontario Public Guardian Trustee. Depending on what your questions are, these are the relevant numbers. And I've also included uh, a link for just looking up what is mental capacity in a more elaborate way than the little points that I mentioned. Uh, today, which was very summarized briefly, um, given the time. Um, just specifically for myself, uh, if you're interested uh, in knowing how I run things, because everybody is different, everybody has different fees, everybody has different processes in general, but I've found over over the years, um, the best way is to, to um, send someone after speaking to them, maybe for 15 minutes on the phone, if it sounds like something uh, that warrants um, my involvement, I will send them a pre-screening questionnaire just to make sure they're indicating to me what's, what's needed. Do they need an interpreter? Do they have glasses? Do they have hearing aids? We want to make the assessment as valid as possible um, because you don't want to say, oh, they didn't understand and meanwhile it was the wrong language or they didn't even have their hearing aid on or they didn't have their glasses. Um, you want to make sure, is there a power of attorney in existence? So if there is, why am I checking off this form uh, uh, as a 16 when there actually is a power of attorney in existence? Um, if there's family disputes going on, um, some assessors are happy to take on everything under the sun. I personally, because I'm a sole practitioner, when it gets really messy, um, it may be beyond my experience and it might be some Thing that requires someone with a little more experience that knows how to uh, speak up in court. Uh, I don't think that's my greatest strength. My strength lies in uh, assessing a client and writing a good report. Um, so that might be something I re-refer and say, keep going down the roster list. Um, and the one thing I want to say is it's not a restraining system. A lot of times people call us and say, this person's not deciding to go to long-term care. They, uh, I want them to go, so they're not making the right decision. Can you do a capacity assessment? Um, nothing in the law, as far as I know, can force a piece of paper, can't force them to live somewhere that they don't want to live. Um, that's, again, something that's maybe court ordered or a judge gets involved in. So I can certainly offer an opinion, but it's not a control method for someone's behavior or decisions. So... Uh, I think that's about it, uh, looking at the time. And these are some resources again, that are really good resources. If someone's really stuck financially and they can't afford to hire a lawyer, there are some um, kits for free POAs uh, on this site um, where you need two witnesses and so on. It'll guide you through it. And again, there's the Ontario Public Guardian Trustee site. So I hope that's helpful. And now I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunil. So I will um, just kind of perhaps take it from here and read out the questions if that's helpful, Sunil, and then maybe sure. you can take an answer from there. I'm just going to start at the top, if that's okay. Um, sure. So the first one from Carol, uh, come here. Can a person under 18 ask to be assessed? Ask to be assessed, but uh, again, uh, there's an Ontario children's lawyer who called me recently um, with a 17 year old. And I can only speak from my experience because, uh, uh, of course, I can't give legal advice, but I ended up calling the capacity assessment office because it was a lawyer from the children's um, office, which is also from the Ministry of Attorney General. And she was saying to me, please check off uh, using the substitute decisions, formal forms um, that look very legal in nature. And I said, as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe it's a substitute decisions act uh, when they're under 18. So let me run that by my um, my uh, coordinator because I, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think I can use these forms. And when I called, my um, coordinator, coordinator did tell me I was correct. 
but I was caught between uh, um, the lawyer saying, but I want you to, and the coordinator saying, but you can't. So I said, well, I think I will defer them like to and ask them to call the capacity assessment office and figure it out between two lawyers because the capacity assessment office also has lawyers in their office to address these things. So uh, to summarize uh, my answer, I hope, hope I'm correct, but I don't believe um, it would be an appropriate place for me other than writing a letter of opinion. Thank you. So next letters from and or letter. The next questions from Andrea. Can a substitute decision maker for a person live in a different province? For example, can a family member living in Ontario be an SDM for someone living in Manitoba? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so what we were told, uh, because we, you know, I get calls even from England and other provinces, and they say my aunt's at the hospital near where you live. Can you see them? And um, there's a practical component to it. So uh, again, uh, I think the the final call. I it's not that I ever say no. I take the I take the assessments, but mm -hmm. I don't know. And in the end, I honestly don't know. Uh, from a practical point of view, if it becomes a logistical nightmare, if then they end up deciding, well, um, if there's no one local and they have to, let's say, check out facilities or something, if they defer then to the PGT or not, or if they say, mm -hmm. I want to maintain control, I don't know. But I do accept referrals from out of town, out yes. of the province. Yeah. Sunil, from um, just to add in from a bit of a, you know, kind of long-term care and I mean, just the gamut. You do see often um, folks that have SDMs that are out of province, out of sheer yeah. just absolute necessity. There are just yeah. simply nobody else. It's not something that, you know, I would or likely Sunil would, you know, um, suggest as the best alternative. And I think you hit it really well when you mentioned yeah. the fact that it's great to have somebody local that can go and visit a facility if it's a long-term care home or, or see that person in their home or be part of those um, conversations in person. Um mm -hmm. Ideally, the person would be close and would be local. Um, it, it does happen, though, outside of that. Yeah, correct. Uh, next question uh, from Carol. What is the next step for a parent who has been managing his child's finances, and now the child is turning 18 and continues to be unable to manage his finances? So it depends. There's two ways to apply for guardianship that I know of. Uh, one is the section 16 that I mentioned, which is the most common, where they um, fill out a form saying uh, they believe that uh, currently, usually in these cases, there is no power of attorney. There's no least intrusive route where we always check that. Do you think this person can actually do a power of attorney with a lawyer instead of doing this capacity assessment or something like that or trusteeship? And if they're looking for full guardianship, they might say, well, no, I'm going to fill out the form for, for a referral form, form four, and um, which an assessor will send to them or they can download off the off the Internet. Um, they fill that out. And basically they're saying, I so and so believe uh, my son or daughter to not be able to uh, manage their finances. I, I to the best of my knowledge, there's no power of attorney in existence and so on. So that's the formal part. Then. Then the assessor, sorry, um, uh, then meets with that client. Let's say it's a section 16, which that which that means it's going to the public guardian and trustee. And then the parent, uh, presuming they they are deemed incapable, then the public guardian and trustee becomes a guardian immediately. And then the parent applies to be the guardian. So it's like a, a, a route like that. And the other route is called a 22, where they take the report I fill out a different box called 22 and they don't fill out the form for uh, referral form and um, same kind of process. I'm gathering the information. Why do you want it? Can they do it with a lawyer? Can they do a POA instead? Okay. No, they can't. Okay. Then what I do is I do the assessment, the interview, the, uh, do the report. They take my report. As far as I know, they go with a lawyer then to the courts and they apply for guardianship right there. It's a little more expensive, which is why I think because not not the fees don't change where I'm concerned. I charge the same amount, but it's more expensive because the lawyer's costs I heard are quite quite high. 
Um, Tanya, I can't hear you right now. As oh. opposed to the first step, right? Which would have been the first the and, yeah. and, and not necessarily having to hire a lawyer personally. Is that the. Yeah, they don't hire a lawyer for the section 16, but the downside, which I'm told you have to know the pros and cons and decide yourself. And I think you, you want to be informed about this is you're applying to get the guardianship back. So some people say, oh, I'm not taking a risk because what if it stays with the guard with the PGT? And then they try to ask me what's the likelihood I'm not allowed to speak on behalf of the PGT, right? They will they will probably like look into the family and say, is there any warring siblings? Is there a situation here? Has uh, has someone been depleting the account? Or I don't know what kind of things they look at. I know they get a lot of files. So usually if it's straightforward, I I what I'm told is they're happy to give it back to the family, but I don't want to speak for them because really uh, it's not my place. Yeah. Fair enough. Thanks, Danielle. That was great. Uh, second org, another question. If you receive a request and there are medical records, can the assessor review the documentation or can you only after review such documents, i.e. medical, banking, and info after they've been advised of their rights? That's an excellent question. Um, it's very important that we should not look at all of these things until we do the rights advice. At the, at, at, at the most, I will ask for some basic information in my intake. And I say, don't send me anything. Don't send me anything until I do the rights advice. Have it ready to go. And it's not like a memory test where, let's say I just saw someone recently who was about 23. And I asked the mother, please have the uh, financial records in front of your daughter so that she can refer to it. Well, I'm, um, that one had to be Zoom. Uh, for for a lot of reasons, but um, so in any case, and the mother basically preferred it to be, um, so so I said have the records in front of her, please, so that she can look down and refer to it. But then the mother sent it to me after I did the rights advice, the the banking information and the medical. Yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another question. If someone is mentally well, but is physically incapacitated such that he cannot do his own banking on a ventilator for life has no POA of property, has no family or friends who can help, is there any way to sign up for PG on PG and t on a voluntary basis? So can the client themselves go to pg and t and say, I don't have anyone to look after me, is what I'm gathering from that question. So, so, so just to summarize to make sure I understood that right, they do have mental capacity, but they just functionally can't get it done? Correct. So let's, they are completely physically incapacitated. So they can't do their banking. They can't do those things like those IADLs of, of life. Um, yeah. They do not have a POA for property. There's no family or friends. Can they willingly go to pg and on their own as the patient and say, I need assistance? So the only thing I can say, because I don't want to speak for the PGT is it's a de decisional mental capacity test. So I don't know that I've ever agreed to accept a referral where it's a physical one. So I can't speak from experience or my knowledge in that. I think that question has to be posed to the PGT and say, would you be willing to accept this? But I do know that one time a social worker actually did call me and said they fell and they hurt their leg, broke their leg or something. Can you, and they can't get to the bank. Can you do the assessment? And I turned it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I said, it, it, to me, it's a decisional test. You guys have to maybe look at options that are less intrusive. Is there someone they can assign like a POA with a lawyer? Like, can they get the lawyer to come in um, and do a power of attorney? Um, and and maybe the lawyer can advise who can that power of attorney, if who can that attorney be? Can it be a lawyer? Can it be a bank person? I don't know. But I honestly have no experience where I've accepted an assessment for that reason. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. So uh, what, a couple more left um, in limbo. Um, are you aware of similar services in other provinces? The opportunity, because I like to learn to sometimes go on YouTube and see, uh, I think BC, British Columbia is so advanced, like the way they, the, some of the, the YouTubes I've watched, um, uh, just the way they spell things out, um, a lot of their similarities about understand and appreciate, um, but, uh, sorry, go back to your question. Like, are you asking yeah. me if I've compared or? No, are there other, are there other capacity assessment offices in other provinces across Canada? 
Like, do they have capacity assessors in other provinces? I believe so. I believe I watched one from BC, but uh, they they have a different they have different legislation. So I'm only I'm I'm only uh, qualified to uh, under the Ministry of Attorney General at Ontario. So um, I don't know what the rules are if they slightly differ. I do believe Quebec was very different when I uh, when I got a referral once from the it was called something else, but it was equivalent to PGT. But they had different rules, and I actually had trouble following it a bit. So mm-hmm. um, I, again, I called the capacity assessment office to say, what are the rules for me? And they said, well, you follow the Ontario rules because of clients in Ontario. Quite tricky. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that, so do you, a uh, quick question on medical assistance in dying. Uh, do you do capacity assessments for MAID? Or, or Some do. A, some do, yes. Some in, in do, a, but sorry to interrupt, uh, Tanya, mm-hmm. but... Some do, and I, I recall that when we were on a Zoom during the height of the pandemic, we were getting a lot of the training virtually from our office because they keep us abreast of things, and they do a very good job with that um, because we're expected to also attend regular uh, upgrading courses from them. They did say, if you're going to take on MAID, please attend workshops. Be informed. Don't just take it because there's another source for you. You know, you have to be ethical about it yourself. Okay. If someone is managed by PG&T in Ontario and moves to another province, do they need to be reassessed or does PG&T follow them? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I know the answer. Um, I would, I I don't, um, I would argue that PG&T would follow likely until someone else could take over. Um, Oh, Yes, but I don't know. A, I don't know the whole. I, I I've not. I've not been with the patient. That was the Quebec example I gave you, where the PG. Well, they're called something else, but it was equivalent, like to the PGT. And I said I've never had a re- referral from Quebec, and she said, "Well, because they live in Dundas now, they're in Ontario, so we need to hand it over to the Ontario PGT." But in order to do that, we have to treat it like she does not have a. POA, I had to run it by the capacity assessment office to make sure I knew what I was doing. And mm-hmm. what they said was the the support person, there's a support person was her friend uh, who met me in Dundas because her family she left behind in Quebec. So the friend who filled out the form for, I think the PGT uh, equivalent of Quebec filled out the form of uh, for for me to then do the assessment and then go to the PGT in Ontario. Yeah. So that that's my only experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think must fall through. Yeah. That's all the questions. Yeah. Okay. I hope Perfect. that helped. It definitely helped. And I think so many of the questions were so pertinent to everything that you were speaking to. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I did include a feedback survey in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you know, we're always looking to improve the sessions and see what you think about our presenters, about our topics, any future topics you'd like to see. So once again, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next ECHO session. Thank you, Sunil and Tanya. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. All right. Bye-bye.